We must make every season better than the last season. And here's why. The secret behind all of Dimension 20 and why my so much of my heart and soul is in it. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Geek Peak. Today I'm talking with Mike Shabak. Shabak has been behind the scenes in virtually every season of Dimension 20. We answered a lot of questions in this interview. There are some that are about the Ravening War, uh, so stay tuned for that. Shabak takes us behind the curtain and shares what it is to direct a season of Dimension 20, what's a day in production looks like. I enjoyed this interview a lot. It also connects a lot of dots that I didn't know about uh, Dimension 20's production. This is an interesting one. So without further ado, enjoy the interview. Mike Shabak, thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here. I am so excited to talk to you. Uh, you've been behind the scenes in, uh, in Dimension 20 since practically the beginning, and you've been behind many college humor things also, even before Dropout was formed. Yeah. Uh, so there are so many things I want to talk to you about. Uh, we also have fan questions. Yes. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, before we get to that, though, uh, there are so many people who unfortunately don't even know who you are or just yep, know you don't. by name. Uh, and uh, I would love for you to introduce us to, your, uh, to, to introduce yourself to us. Uh, so uh, people that uh, love Dimension 20 uh, and might not be familiar with you, uh, get to know you a little bit. Uh, hi, Dimension 20 fans. My name is Michael Schaubach. I'm the director of Dimension 20. Uh, you don't normally see me. If you watch the BTS, maybe every now and then you'll see me and I'll get interviewed. But mostly I am behind the camera. And I am the one that stands outside the dome and I protect it from all the chaos out there so that Brennan and the cast can have a wonderful time inside the dome and make an awesome TV show for you all to enjoy. So that's, that's, that's basically who I am. That's awesome. You have done such a good job with the, the minis, uh, with the hand modeling <laughs> of the minis. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so take us back a little bit to before Dropout, even maybe before college humor, what inspires you to be a director? What inspired you to be, uh, to, to start on this path that you are on today? It's a really great question. So I, I started college humor way back in 2008 um, as an editor, actually. And I was an editor for the first uh, decade of my career. Uh, and then a college friend of mine was working for a sketch comedy group called Dutch West. Uh, with a lot of amazingly funny people in it who are my friends, including Sam Rice, who then got hired at, at College Humor. And, and um, so he took my friend David with him. And uh, so David became the sole editor at College Humor. They sold a show to MTV called The College Humor Show. And he called me up and said, uh, I needed help cutting this TV show. At that time, I was almost exclusively in... Um, short form digital nonprofit type stuff. I loved um, documentary and I did a lot of that in college. Uh, specifically right before College Humor, I was at a company called Good Magazine. And Good Magazine at that time had a digital branch and I was the head of their post-production and their main editor. And I did a lot of really cool stuff. If you want to check it out on the internet, you can go look for the Look series, L-O-O-K. They were short form docs about cool things that were happening around the world. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And um, so doc is, 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 is hard. It's taxing. It's uh, a lot of invention, which is really cool. And I, I think I was just at the point in my career where when I got the call from my friend David, it was like, come on over and, and cut with a script for a while. And I was like, that sounds interesting. Like, you mean I just follow the directions and then I make it funny? Cool. Um, I'll do that for like a year or two, you know, I'll just like a year or two, I'll go to college humor. I'll get some comedy under my belt. I loved doing comedy. I'd done a, a sort of like a pilot with some friends in Minneapolis before I moved to New York city and it got into the New York television festival. And so comedy sort of always been a part of my life. And so when this call came, it was like, yeah, okay, let's, you know, let's go do some comedy. So anyway, uh, 15 years later, uh, <laughs> Here I am, still a college humor. Uh, I was an editor and then I ended up running post. 
Uh, I managed the move from New York to LA with all of College Humor's IP. Um, we had a whole SAN system, and so I broke that down and sent it on a truck across the, the, the country while I had a stack of drives with every single College Humor sketch and show that we had ever done safely back in New York until we were able to set the SAN up. So it was a crazy move out here. I moved my family out here, that was 2013. And then from about 2013 to 2016-ish, um, I started just getting little directing roles because I was sort of putting it out there to Sam that I would love an opportunity to direct. I had edited so much, I was ready for it. And I uh, just kind of started to build and build and build until there was a, a director opening and I was offered the opportunity to, to move over to director editor at that time. Uh, and there was another counterpart, his name was Ryan Martin, and Ryan and I were the director editors, and then we were able to, we ended up directing so much because of the advent of, of um, a dropout, our plates just got so full that we were allowed to just become directors and not have to edit anymore, uh, which was a great gift. And then so for when the dropout thing hit, uh, it was just, it was like madness. It was like, how many shows can we make in a short amount of time? So in that initial uh, burst of original programming, I directed um, the upgraded version of um, actually prior to that. Um, prior to that, it was in the office and then we did a few pilots in uh, another part of the office before we built a set for it, the set that you know now. Uh, so I did that with Mike Trapp. And that one's actually really important. I'll come back to them um, actually. Uh, Rank Room with Katie Maravich, that was Katie's show. Um, there was a little D&D show called um, Dimension 20, that one. Uh, and then I did <laughs> um, uh, Gods of Food and Total Forgiveness. So I did all, I did all of those almost all at the same time. It, it was a really wild two wow. years in my life where I was uh, overlapping a lot. As a matter of fact, for Tiny Heist, uh, that was one weekend with the McElroys and uh, I was shooting Gods of Food that weekend. So David Kearns, executive producer, came on and just monitored and helped out with the with the um, onset stuff for that weekend. I never met them. And I had talked to them. We had uh, we were doing remote meetings and all that, but I, I've never actually met them because uh, the weekend that they shot that I was shooting Gods of Food and then I came back and shot the minis. Uh, so, yeah, it, it was a, it was a really, really fun time. Uh, lots of really cool content to 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 make, and Dimension Twenty was just one of those shows. I mean, obviously, I'm actually oh, so I'm actually so so. Uh, uh, Trap just got tired of writing the all of the 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 questions. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, it's daunting, and so we needed we needed help, and so this name got floated to us. Uh, Brennan Lee Mulligan, who was a super smart guy, and uh, he was a nerd. He could totally come in and write all these questions, so he totally did. And we had built this temporary set before we built the big set, and it was little. It was this little side office that we'd actually, you'll see, you, if you watch some sketches, you'll see, uh, basically it's the wood panel room that has the College Humor logo. Mm -hmm. We did all the original uh, um, rank room stuff in there as well. And so there wasn't a lot of room, so, there, so not everyone could be inside the room. So it was me, and uh, sound and the DP were out. The uh, we had some camera operators. And then, of course, we had the cast and trap on one side of the room. And I was sitting behind a black curtain because of the way they had it all lit. And I had just a, a little bit of room next to me. And I remember saying, like, I need Brennan in here with me. I need him next to me because I think that uh, we're going to need him to answer for some of these <clears throat> questions. Because that's that that had like there was some arguing that was going on at the time. But once once we started to bring in outside people to be on that show, like the arguing just amped up. And what a perfect person to have by my side to, to by my side to argue endlessly about every single um actually question. But Brennan Lee Mulligan. So I brought him in. He sat next to me and we sat next to each other for the rest of the time that I was on the show uh, until he moved on and was doing Dimension 20 uh, exclusively brought on the amazing Michael Saltzman. And now Michael's even on camera because of how much arguing there is, uh, which is such a great progression. But I was I was lucky enough to do the first uh, 27 episodes all the way up through the um, ba the first Battle Royale. And uh, that's how Brennan and I met. So when Brennan went and pitched the D&D &D show, they were like, yeah, absolutely. Who do you want to direct it? 
he called my name out and I'll be forever grateful for that. Um, but it was because he and I sat together and went to battle on him. Actually, uh, I think he did exclusively the first 15 or so, 16 episodes of that before we brought in Saltzman. So that's where, that's how it all plays. It's, it, it, it the, the, my career has been sort of this like stumbling through, uh, uh, long periods of really, really hard work that have then ultimately paid off, which is really great. Like nothing, nothing ever came fast for me. And that's just how it is. Uh, I think mainly I mentor a lot of people and that's one of the big lessons I say, which is like great things like take time to build and dimension 20 is like the perfect example of that because we, the way we wanted to, 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 to develop the show and make the show right was that we wanted to fill in a niche that didn't exist yet. When Brennan called me up to direct the show, like nothing was created yet. He just had this idea. And so what he had me do is he sent me all these links of all the other TTRPG shows that were out there. He's watch all of these and that, and then you'll understand where Dimension 20 fits in the perfect whole of what people are not creating. Because the idea, and, and still to this day, is we never wanted to come in and, t- and take from somebody else's bowl. We saw this community as a community of people that just wanted more content. They just wanted more to watch. So we always... We always positioned ourselves in the TTRPG uh, genre as we're joining the party and we're here to help. And that's how it's always been since the very beginning. Matt Mercer was on our very first side quest. I mean, from from the get go uh, and the whole TTRPG community uh, that I've come to know and love and become friends with a, a vast majority of them. We all love each other. We're all rooting for each other and we're all helping each other. When we bring fans in, they see their content and likewise, it all gets, everybody just gets what they want, which is more people to watch their content and more people get to watch the content that they're out there to watch. So, so, uh, that's how, that's how we sort of attack the show. We wanted to do something different. Um, the minis were a big part of that. And that is really what, what interested me. I love doing unscripted. I do, I'm a director who does both scripted and unscripted, which is pretty rare in this industry. You kind of have to choose a path and that's the path you get known for. Because of my experience at College Humor, I was allowed to, to do both, which is great. I love unscripted. I, I think it's great. You can make a massive amount of content in a short amount of time and you can really focus on making sure that content is, is high tier. Right. You can really focus on the lighting. The cameras don't move. So you can make the set perfect. And so I, I liken I liken unscripted and especially Dimension 20 as a director to being sort of the party host and also the the vanquisher of bad vibes. Right. Like <laughs> it's all about the vibes on Dimension 20. And if they're feeling if the if the cast is feeling anything from the set drama or whatever it leaks into to the dome and it will it would change the show so basically what i what i like to what i like to build dimension 20 as to new people who come on because we're constantly bringing on new people to fill different roles it's just how the business works people get better and go do bigger stuff and we get people in who want to be a part of the show and what i say is that we create what we're doing here at dimension 20 is we're doing um what I call the television show, making the television show the ride. So you come in like you're coming into Disney or Universal Studios. I'm going to give you the best making the television show experience possible. Every single person, that's not just talent. Every single person that comes in and is a part of our show and a part of our family, you get treated with mutual respect. We work really, really hard and we love what we do. And everybody goes home feeling good about what they did. And so that was sort of my contribution when when Brennan said, I want to fill this this hole in the TTRPG world with Dimension 20, which is, um, you know, uh, a set limit to the number of episodes. So in, in, in the case that we started with 17, I think it ended up becoming 18 um, because of the, the big media ending and um, and the, and the episodes be no longer than, you know, three hours. Obviously, we've gone over a few times, but that's sort of where he wanted to fit in. And then the, the minis and really focusing on the art of the minis and then getting in and shooting the minis. I feel like the minis part of it and the and the art behind the filming of the minis is a great collaboration. Obviously, I direct that and I've evolved that. But the other contribution that I feel like I have, which is unseen 
And and for good measure, I, I do love the idea that I am behind the scenes and people don't really know that I'm there or that the show seems easy to make. Like that means I'm doing my job really well. Um, but but my other contribution is this beautiful set culture where everybody agrees to come on and be the best version of themselves and treat each other well and be kind and be patient and have a good time and work really, really hard. Uh, so all of that, all of those ingredients mixing together and stirring, it did really well and Fantasy High did take off, but it has been slowly building. And I feel like that is great ingredients to any artistic endeavor is that if you can do that and repeat it and get better as you do it, you will build an audience and you can create something like Dimension 20, but it takes a great deal of time. Uh, one of my great philosophies of Dimension 20 is that we must, we must make every season better than the last season because, and here's why, the secret behind all of Dimension 20 and why my so much of my heart and soul is in it is that there are people out in the world that are lost. They are alone in the world. They do not belong or they do not feel they belong anywhere where they currently are physically. And they tune into Dimension 20 and they go, that's my people. That's my home. That's where I belong. And you do belong here. So the better we make this show, the more people are going to see it. And the more people we can find that are lost and say, you're not lost. You're found and you're found right here with us. And this is where you belong. And look on camera. It's people just like you. You are being heard. You're getting representation. You belong here. So that's why every season we have to do something different. We have to go bigger. We have to just be better because we, we find more people. Every season we put this show out, we find more more lovely people that just need a place to be. And so that's why we do it. Wow. Um. I love this so much. There's so many things you said that were like, um, like I resonate with them so much. Like, first of all, the thing that uh, uh, it takes time. This is so true. Like a lot of people are like thinking uh, that uh, uh, the rise of someone is like uh, an overnight success, but that overnight success is like, uh, uh, is like, followed by years of of like a, a lot of lots of preparation lots of training lots of work uh and, and also like the bit about uh dimension 20 being home uh this is this is i i love this so much it's my home it's my home <laughs> it's my home right it's everybody that I, I also have this saying where it's the more people that call dimension 20 their show the better the show gets like there's just so many people out there that that do so many different roles and they go dimension 20 that's my show i love that it is their show if they help make it it's their show if you watch it and enjoy it it's your show the show belongs to everybody and the more people it belongs to the better it gets okay so now that we talked a bit about like how the show is like risen and and your role in it would you uh take us along on how uh a work day uh, for you looks like on the set of Dimension 20. Okay, so shoot day. Because there's yeah. like, there's months and months of prep. Like we 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 aired the last episode of uh, Never After all, all two days short of the one year anniversary of the first meeting I ever attended for Never After. So that project took a year, year to do. Yeah. Um, so a shoot day, uh, we normally shoot uh, nine to nine. Uh, it's 12, so we don't go over and um, we have a lot of work to do so there's just a lot that has to get done right like we're in COVID time so a big part of the the beginning of the day is making sure that everyone gets tested and everyone's safe my biggest thing my number one biggest thing when on set days is safety's first and no one no one no one is is not subject to that everyone deserves the same mutual safety and safety is so much more than physical safety Right. There's emotional safety, too. So like I make that clear from the get go. So one of the ways we do uh, we help with uh, uh, physical safety is we do COVID tests and we're going to continue to do those uh, for the foreseeable future. Even if the industry starts to scale back on them, we just do it because it's good practice. And boy, howdy, have we avoided some disasters by doing it. So 
Um, it's just it's just a good thing to do. It gets people uh, sort of around outside in the parking lot, and the vibe starts to grow, and everybody's happy and cheerful. I mean, I'm I'm like a, 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 I'm like a wild person straight out of the car. I'm like, hi, how are you? And hey, what's going on? And that's and yelling at people and like, yay, we're gonna do this. We're making a TV show. You know, <laughs> stuff like that, which is true. You know, like I think it doesn't really resonate with a lot of people, depending on the job you have. But it's like you are part of making a television show. So some somewhere in your life, you were watching television and you were like, I want to do that. And so you set out to do that. Guess what? You're doing it. You succeeded. So a lot of times I'll be like, whoever it was that believed in you, whoever it was that said, yeah, go do that. Call them up tonight and be like, hey, I'm doing it. Um, so then I kind of move in first days on sets, um, are a little wild because, uh, we had to build the set. Um, uh, we use the same area as all the other dropout shows. So a lot of it is just, uh, we've, we've already done a sort of prep tech day, but there's just like things that need to get done in the morning. Cast is starting to arrive. So every time a cast member arrives, I want to be there. I want to greet them. They're getting tested. They get brought in. We bring their stuff up to the green room and they sit in the chair with Denise and her team. And they really start to get sort of centered and Zen-like, you know, uh, the HMU chair is such an important part of the, of the acting process because it centers you. And then there's this version of you when you first wake up in the morning, we all have it. And we're like, that's me. Cool. <laughs> when you sit down in the HMU chair, it, there's with, with Denise Valentine, there is a calmness. She's got you. She's, she holds you no matter how you feel in the morning in one hour after you're done, you look like a superstar. And that's just the magic that she does. And that's all a part of the culture. Every piece of the, the routing process, forecast is all about the culture and making sure that by the time they enter the dome, they are happy, they are confident, they feel beautiful, and they are caffeinated. And they're just ready to rock. <laughs> Caffeine is a huge part of Dimension 20. And maybe Brennan's talked about it before, but he just, I mean, he does one cup after another after another. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> so, so I'm sort of keeping an eye on all of that and making sure that the path for the talent to come in, um, in into HMU and up to the green room, that everything feels super chill, food is waiting for you and this, and you know exactly where you're supposed to be at all times, while at the same time solving a myriad of problems that are happening on the tech side. We just have, we have a lot of tech on the show. We have a, we have an LED wall that now has projections. We have, you know, at some, at some points in time, if we're shooting minis, we have five cameras rolling. That's, you know, we have media that has to be managed and we have cables that are running under people's feet that sometimes break and, you know, adapters that blow out and all kinds of, of um, really fun stuff uh, that happens that uh, that I'm also appreciative of of my age and maturity, too, because I feel like I'd be a different director in my 20s and I'm in my 40s now and I feel like in my 40s I've seen almost everything. And so when anything comes to me, I'm always ready to to deal with it and so really like the only enemy we only have one enemy at dimension 20 and that is the clock uh so we're always managing the time because and uh that's the other thing that i tell my team is that any minute you can find we hand to brennan brennan needs all the minutes so wherever you can find a minute we take it we package it up and we hand that minute to brennan because the more minutes brennan has to prep and make the show the better the show is so we're always fighting the clock to find those minutes for Brennan. So uh, at some point in time, Brennan moves to the chair and gets into the dome and we just try to keep everything nice and quiet by that time. Uh, all the tech stuff should be done, all the adjusting of the lights and everything starts to feel about an hour to 30 minutes before the shoot, everything starts to feel really calm and that's intentional. Uh, we, we talk quietly, we move with purpose and we just try to create a really safe and chill space. Um, the, at the, the cast is coming down at this point. They're getting their microphones on and uh, I'm chit-chatting with them, answering any questions they might have. Sometimes they have uh, questions for Rick. We're finding Rick and bringing Rick over. Oh, the spell card and I want this and changed and oh, I wanna do, you know, this on my character sheet needs to be and we're reprinting. And so all these things, like it's a little bit of a flurry, but we're, oh, you, the, you know, we talk in soft tones and oh yeah, of course we can take care of that. It's all a part of the process. And it, and it, and it, and it, it goes out to everybody on the crew too, because now the crew's on a nice quiet set. It's not chaotic. No one's yelling at anybody. No one's mad. 
And so everyone is sort of working at their at their best uh, because they're, they're they're enjoying it. They're enjoying doing this. This is making the TV show the ride, and it's 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 going well. About 15 minutes before we're actually going to sit down and shoot, we do a safety meeting. And that's pretty standard for any production. We stand around and we hear from our producer. We hear from our CCO. That's the COVID compliance officer. Just about like keeping your masks on and thank you for being safe. And then I get to say a little bit and I say all kinds of stuff. I had a speech about Cats, the movie, when I first came back from uh, when I when we first came back from <laughs> lockdown, I had, I had watched Cats, the movie. Uh, during lockdown, thinking that I was just going to like make fun of it for two hours. And I ended up like crying and falling in love with the film. And so my early speeches coming back were all about being jellical and let's be jellical to each other and jellical cats and all this. And Brennan and I would get into uh, the weeds a little bit on the meaning of jellical. And um, so that was always fun. But I always find something, what I just said about, about finding people is sort of the main speech that I have now, which is that there are people that are lost. There's people that are lost out there. They they feel like the world is against them. And quite frankly, in some scenarios, the world is against them. And um, it's our little it's our little portal through their phone or their TV or their computer that they get respite from the stresses of their of their lives. Um, and then uh, Brennan will say something and then we'll move into the dome. And that's when things start to feel a little exciting. We have PAs that are going around and they're getting the drink orders and it's all this hush tones and Brennan's got the headphones on and is doing the last bit all the way to the end because Brennan during that prep process is also up in the green room and getting last bits of information. Sometimes players will come in and be like, I have a little bit of a change or I want to add this to my backstory. Brennan's taking all of that in real time and just type, if you see any BTS of Brennan just typing away, it's because he's just downloaded some information from somebody. And so we're leaving we're leaving Brennan alone we're we're I'm chit-chatting with the cast it's feeling really good it's starting to get quiet we're getting close to the shoot time i kind of creep over to Brennan and i'm like hey buddy how you doing and he'll either be like i need 5 more minutes cool you got it 5 minutes whatever time you want it's your minutes or he'll be like yeah let's do it and at that point i'll look to my sound engineer and just make sure, because that whole time while they're chit-chatting and I'm chit-chatting with, with the cast, we're doing sound checks, right? So all of it feels like a conversation. It feels like we're all in here and having a good time, but there's work being done. The cameras are being adjusted. The lighting is being tweaked while we're doing all of that. I'll look at my sound engineer. I'll look at my DP and I'll say, are you guys ready to go? And you know, they'll say yes. And I'll say, okay, let's roll sound. And that's when really things start to, you can start to kind of feel the pressure when I call out roll sound. Roll sound then gets cameras to roll. Uh, we clap, uh, you know, with the slate. And I kind of look around, depending on who's at the table, if there's any new people at the table, I just say like how happy I am you're here. Welcome to the Dimension 20 family. Uh, if it's the core cast, I, I, uh, I always like to just, I always like to just reminisce a little bit and say I, 2017, I mean, we've been doing this for so many years. It's such a special time when you're calling action for the very first time on the first episode of a new season. It's just the beginning of a new journey. I get very nostalgic. <laughs> it's <laughs> such a special, it's just such a special thing to be a part of the show and a part of this business and do it the way that I want it done, which is good and healthy and, and positive. And then uh, I don't call action for the show, actually. I look at Brennan and I say, uh, Brennan, the floor is yours. And I walk back and I sit at it and he, ah, he just, and then it explodes and it is. Uh, it, it, it becomes the show and we laugh and we, uh, we listen and we're watching. I'm watching for stray hairs that fall. So like the whole, the whole, the whole time that the show's going on, there's this whole group of people that are there just pressing in all the good energy and all the eyeballs and all of their talents to make sure that this thing that is so big, we're going to shoot for an hour. Like we shoot for a whole hour before our first break. And then after the break, we could shoot for another two hours. So we're just all there just pressing so hard with all of our know-how, all of our expertise, just to make sure that that runs smoothly. Every now and then there's a little, you know, Lou's got a necklace on, it's hitting the mic and I got to, you know, 
I always have this thing with my sound engineer, like, does it have to happen now or can it happen in five minutes? Because I can find a natural break in five minutes. But if it has to happen now and that the person's talking is no longer being recorded, we need to stop now. <laughs> yeah. So all these little things that are happening that we don't, you know, obviously with because it's an edited show we take out, but it's all very, you know, it's all very intense. And uh, there's a lot of moving parts because in this is a unique show. TTRPGs are a unique show for shooting. Normally in a, a single cam feature film, you can shoot for a couple minutes maybe and you get it. Like this is it. Like we don't redo. This is improv. So sound engineers and managing seven microphones, it's a huge job. Uh, and so they're sitting next to me so that they can get to me quickly. My DP sits next to me who's working the lights and uh, everyone has access to me. And then I'm the one that kind of goes and stops it if needs to. If I need to, I give Brennan time checks so that he knows how long we're in it. We get to our first uh, bathroom break. That's a nice way to sort of reset. PAs go in, clear out all the old cups or the snacks or whatever and reset all of that. And then we just go. We the, the second half of the show is kind of we go until somebody says that they have to use the restroom or uh, we finish the episode. And so then right after that, we shoot the um, we shoot the adventuring party. So it's all fresh in their minds. And then we go to lunch. And we all have a nice time. We sit around with each other. Talon and uh, crew sometimes sit next to each other. It's all very friendly vibe. Um, and we come back after lunch and we just basically do what we did in the morning and the, in the evening. We shoot the episode, break out an hour, shoot the rest of the episode, finish off with an adventuring party, and then uh, we go home for the day. So that's, that's pretty much it. And so uh, Brennan and I always walk out together. And so he's, you know, he doesn't, we, we get the actors out on time. There's this time constraints of when you're shooting. So we make sure that the actors get out on time. Since Brennan's creator, executive producer, doesn't really fall into that. Like he can become executive producer the minute that his acting hour is done. Um, we chit chat about the day. We talk about the things we want to fix or the things that went well. Um, anybody that we need to talk to in the cast about a story or anything like that, uh, we just sort of walk out together into the parking lot. We say goodbye to each other and uh, we go home and then we come back and we do it all again the next day. And we do it as many times as it takes to make a season. Wow. Okay. So I remember uh, that there was, uh, may, maybe it was like a long time ago, but uh, I think there was once this uh, claim that uh, Escape from the Blood Keep was uh, w recorded in one weekend. Yeah. So, uh, so is that <laughs> yeah. like? Woo! Yeah. yeah. So it, that's six episodes, like yeah. in three two days. days. Three. Oh, three days. Okay. Well, you know what? We might have done. <laughs> we did tinker, and I can't remember what we tinkered with. Um, so long ago now, we did tinker with trying to do three episodes in a day, but I feel like that was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But we might have done three and three. We might have done three and three. That was a whirlwind. That was a whirlwind. <laughs> we, once we saw that the show could work, the next thing that you do as a company, right? Like I, I, I wasn't really a part of it, but the people above us who have to manage all of the content and all the budget for all the shows is they just start to tinker. Well, how many episodes can Brennan do in a day? He could probably do three and has done three. Is that the best thing for the show? Probably not. Okay, great. You know what I mean? So then it's like, it's just been like a give and take of like, okay, how quickly can we, we make the show? Well, we can make it this fast and it's better when we have this many days in between certain episodes. But yeah, that might have been done in two days. Uh, I'd have to check tape on that. It's either two or three days. But I know I know there were a few times we did three episodes in a day because we weren't doing adventuring parties. Um, it was still very hard. And uh, Brennan is, I mean, Brennan's capabilities and talent are out of this world. I, I, I can't speak enough about his genius. So if anyone can do it, it's Brennan. But the question is, it isn't can you do it it's should you do it and uh, we've now answered the question that is we we really can't do more than two by the way i want to i want to point out my mug this is ash minnick who was our producer for uh, starstruck made these um handmade mugs with her cricket for us so it says a uh, member of the worst crew and then up here it's uh the ball the ball is rolling up ball is rolling uh, up so this is my little souvenir from starstruck <laughs> 
Starstruck was so good. I loved Starstruck. I love uh, Starstruck. The best part for me for Starstruck is that I got another mom uh, in Elaine Lee. So I like basically took on another mother because you really can't have too many mothers in this world. So if anyone wants, if, if you can take on more moms, like do it because moms are great. And so I got to meet Elaine and then I got to sort of talk to Elaine about like how, how um, meaningful Dimension 20 has been in, in my life and how meaningful her uh, guiding of Brennan has been in my life as a parent and how it's affected me as a parent because she put so much time and effort into crafting um, crafting a family legacy of storytelling that then we get to be a part of through Dimension 20, the work, making costumes, doing a LARPing, doing the, his, his own run games every single weekend, all the driving that she did, all of the organizing that she did, just to, I mean, the fact that she went out and found his very first game with a bunch of 20 year olds, like I have the son and he really needs a community of people. Like just her ferocious love for Brennan, uh, both her kids, her ferocious love of her children and her family and the importance of storytelling and creating art and how she passed that down to Brennan and supported him and then created the show that like feeds my family is so meaningful. And the fact that I got to meet the genesis of that, the mom that said, uh, I'm going to go and find this game from like, what's this game? It's Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. Uh, my son loves to do pretend this and, and tell stories. This is the game for him. Like just that moment has like think about all everything that that moment has now created for everybody like it's unbelievable yes. so starstruck has a really special place in my heart because of that shout out to elaine lee we love you yeah we love <laughs> you we really do okay uh before we move to fan questions we are going to do a role for spoilers oh god uh uh die of uh okay let's uh, see what we a roll of the can, can we, let's, or let's do this you roll <laughs> And then depending on the number you get, I still need a little time to figure out what it is that I'm going to spoil. Um, so let's first of all figure out the severity of the spoiler. Yes. Okay. So I I have like, let's see if I can see this in the camera. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to roll and, oh, that is a 19. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been really great working on Dimension 20. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. You need a 19 spoiler? So it's not a net 20. So you don't have to like... What's Brennan? Uh, what has Brennan done? And that, what did uh, Rick Perry do? What did, Do you remember Rick Perry's spoiler? Uh, actually, Rick Perry was... Uh, was before I started doing the segment of no. Wolf of Spoilers. Okay, so, so he, what did Brennan so he do? Got out of it. <laughs> uh, so uh, Brennan had uh, uh, Brennan had good but vague answers. Like it would be like, oh, we can discuss this. <laughs> we can like try to understand what this means. Uh, and also for uh, World Beyond Number, uh, we did a World for Spoilers uh, uh, role. And uh, he said something about Lou's character. Um, and uh, that was something that if you listen to the first episode, then you, you understand what, what it is. Uh, but if you haven't, which was what happened back there, back then, uh, it sounds vague. And it sounds like... <gasps> I'm so not prepared for this. Okay, <laughs> let me stew on it. I don't want to, I'm not going to warm myself out of this, but I will say that I'm a very dangerous individual when it comes to this show uh, <laughs> because of my proximity to this show. And they are the team that the, uh, here's what I'll say. The team that, that is in charge of the marketing for this show is a brilliant team of people. They do it brilliantly and they do it very scientifically and they have a plan for s revealing of certain things. And so I'm not a part of that. I'm not a part of that plan. Like that, all that gets done automatically. It's a great gift. It just happens. So all of a sudden I'll be watching YouTube and see the next thing and be like, oh, okay, I guess that's now known. Um, so my biggest fear is to sort of messing up their thing because obviously the spoilers would be like, um, since Ravening Wars been, been announced, 
uh, it, it might be fun to have a, a fun spoiler for Ravening War, but like, I mean, I don't know what they have planned. So let me stew on it, or Let me stew sure. on it. Sure. Uh, because I, I, um, I, I don't want to mess I, anybody else's job up, you know? Yeah. I will say, like, you don't have to say a spoiler that is, like, story or, or something like that related. You could say a spoiler that is production related. And uh, maybe when we see it, we understand it. <laughs> uh, but it, but it, do, it, it doesn't like it doesn't give away anything that you know marketing would have said like oh we need this to re- be revealed at a specific point in time. Okay, I'll think on it. I'll think. Okay, it just scares okay. me. I'm just Oren. I'm scared. I'm totally scared. <laughs> I have I have so many, uh, but I want to make sure that it's something good and something like I could say like uh, it's not a spoiler, but it's a fun behind the scenes. I don't. I mean. Uh, Maybe that's uh, look. I'll throw this one out there, and then maybe I can think of something better after we answer some fan questions. Okay. Uh, I woke up on the first day of the Ravening War with the flu, so I wasn't actually on set for all of the Ravening War because we shot it in such quick succession. Uh, I had influenza, a. and so we. But but luckily, because of of COVID, we had all of these streaming. Uh, devices all set up for people to watch remotely because we'd always like to keep our set numbers low. So I actually directed that show from a laptop sitting on my chair where I would normally sit zooming Video Village while also watching a feed uh, of the show. And what's interesting about that is that because I had 104 temperature during all of the filming of it, in my mind's eye, because they put my laptop where I normally sit, I remember that I was there. But I know I wasn't. But my brain tells me I was there. And then, of course, we got healthy and I was able to come in and shoot the minis. But, yeah, built big build up with Matt and it was so fun. And then I couldn't even be there for the shoot day. And these things happen and they've happened to other uh, crew members too. And and so I I really want to lead by example and say, look, this isn't something you can muscle through. Like if you're sick, stay home and keep everybody else safe. And we have the technology to keep you tapped in if need be. Uh, But anyway, that's a little behind the scenes thing uh, that probably wouldn't normally normally be. uh, (laughs) So so thankfully we had David Kearns come in for two of the days, we shot three days and then we had um, Kyle Rohrbach, who was our, he's our head of production, come in and help out uh, for onset stuff. Uh, but I was still at the safety meeting. Uh, they, they held the laptop up. I was able to still do my speech. Like like all the things I would normally do when I'm physically there, I wasn't physically there. But because I was so delirious, my brain is like, no, you were there. You were, of course you were there. <laughs> yeah. It's, anyway. It's the, the ultimate theater of the mind. <laughs> truly, truly. It really was. Uh, anyway, okay, okay, so that's a little fun fact of Ravening War. Uh, I'll try to think of something vague enough to. Uh, uh, there's okay. so much stuff. Ravening War is going to be so good. <laughs> I'm just I'm throwing that out there. It's it's just it's so good. It's so good. Interrupting the video to thank today's sponsor, my patrons. You are the most amazing people on the planet, and your generous support helps keep this thing going. So from the bottom of my heart to you, thank you so much for supporting the channel. If you, the viewer, want to become a member, become a patron, you can go to either patreon.com forward slash the Oren Cohen or click the join button below. It is the same price. Uh, Whatever you choose to do, it's fine. Some benefits for becoming a patron or a member, getting the interview a week earlier, getting it without ads and getting it without this sponsorship insertion. So thank you so much again for uh, those of you who are patrons and members. Thank you for watching. And now back to the video. Okay, so we are going to start answering some fan questions. Uh, The first one comes to us from Hazley. And Hazley asks, out of all the different hats and roles directors get to step up and perform, especially for smaller scale productions, which one is your favorite? For example, you edited the trailer for Mice and Murder? Yes, because uh, I was an editor and uh, I knew that I knew that footage the best. And so that that was really a lot of fun to do. It was it was a, a tumultuous because I hadn't done uh, I hadn't done editing at that speed 
for a while. So my, I was a little rusty, but once I got the typewriter effect in, like I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do the tail tail thing. Um, that, that's kind of like where it kind of started. And then of course the cast just came in and they were so funny. The, I had too much footage to, to choose from, but I would say that like as a director for, for anything, small scale or medium size stuff that I've done, um, I feel like that I'm really directing when I'm problem solving uh, things to keep to keep it on track. I feel like I feel like sitting back in your chair and it's all just kind of working feels really good because that's the machine that we've built together. Like, oh, it's working. But it's when things go wrong that are out of your control and how you deal with that. I feel like that's when I'm truly like putting on my director hat because that's because that's why a director is there. It's not when, because everything is going correctly. It, it's there to, to, to keep it on track and to make sure that, that the project still gets completed um, in the time allotted and not go over budget, even though all of these things are going wrong. So I would say that like working closely with my inner team, which is like my producer, my DP, and our coordinator and and problem solving issues that come up and doing that expertly and keeping us on the rails is like one of my most favorite things to do. I hate it when things go wrong and it bugs me endlessly, but I also see it as a challenge and I know that it's a part of the game. So that, that's really like the best part. I mean, obviously talking to actors about about their roles, about intention, about all that kind of stuff, especially for scripted stuff is 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 where it's at. I mean, the actors are mine, like I'm the director, so they're my people uh, and um, and so I have I care for them very deeply, and and I am their anchor um, because I'm the one behind the camera watching their performance. So that is very fulfilling. But yeah, it's when I can problem solve and keep a show on the rails and get it done on time, and it's good. Then I feel like like okay, that's why that's why I belong here, you know. Okay, uh, the next one is not really a question; it's uh, a comment from Stout, and Stout says. I honestly couldn't think of a question, but I just wanted to compliment Shabak's facial hair because it looks fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. This is sort of my transition into directing, actually. I didn't, oh, I couldn't really okay. grow a mustache until my late 30s. And I just started uh, during, during uh, one of the holiday breaks uh, back in 2016, 2017, I just uh, didn't shave for a little bit. And my son, who was five at the time, was like, um, grow a mustache. I want to see what it looks like. And I remember it's actually Emily Axford. I grow facial hair so slowly. Like this whole thing probably took a whole year for it to like fully come wow. to fruition. And so I had to have people around me that really loved me because <laughs> it was sketchy for a while. But it was actually Emily Axford. Um, I don't know if I've ever told Emily this, but I feel like maybe I have. Uh, we were We were doing a show together. And, um, or maybe Emily was doing something in a, a neighboring edit suite. I can't remember the context, but anyway, there were two teams that were at the, that, that were at the office really late at night. It was like midnight or something. We all decided that we wanted to order food together. And, uh, it was much smaller at that point in time. It was like, it hadn't quite filled in here and it came to a point and Emily Axford, uh, who I love and I've worked with since New York city, um, since the days of New York city. Uh, said, you know, Mike, normally, well, she didn't call me Mike. She calls me Shabak. She calls her own husband Murph. So she goes, normally, Shabak, I don't like like mustaches on men. I just don't like them. It's just, just not my, they're not my vibe. I was not into them. But yours, you kind of look like a bandit. And that's cool. And it was like, it was that moment that was like, oh, because I thought maybe I just had like a regular one of these guys. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And it started to curl up and everything. So I'm like, I'm just going to have a curly mustache. And then from that point on, like my son just took over and was like, that's hilarious. That's cool. <laughs> and so I leave it up to both my son, two sons now, and I leave it up to both of them. The moment they say shave it off, it's gone. It's going to go away. I keep it solely for their entertainment. Uh, my, my older son loves it because I'm known as the mustache dad at school. And so, you know, that gives him some, some clout, I guess. Um, I, I just enjoy it because because 
uh, it brings a smile to people's face. It's so silly. It's just the silliest thing. It's a curly mustache, but it really brings people like it really makes people smile. And like when I'm grocery shopping or whatever, like it just brings a smile to people's faces that like, here's this thing. And like, do you put wax in it? Yeah, totally put wax and you twirl it. And oh, that, you know, so many questions about it. Uh, so I love it. It's great. It's a, it's a little extra maintenance. Um, but if it entertains my sons, then uh, it's here to stay, you know, for the time being. Amazing. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Sarah. And Sarah asks, what's an element of production most fans don't know about? An element of production that most fans don't know about. Huh, Dimension 20 is pretty... Uh, we are pretty transparent. I mean... Um, I would say, I would say sort of the big thing, a lot of times people will walk in, right? And I, I've already mentioned it, but it's funny because a lot of times people will walk into Dimension 20 and they'll be like, this show is simple. Like, look how simple this show is. Everyone just sits around a table, nobody moves. And it's like, it couldn't be, it couldn't be further from the truth because obviously we have, uh, it, it looks simple because of all the extremely talented people we have putting the show together, including the cast who just sort of effortlessly sits down and improvises for three hours. Like, yeah, not everyone can do that. That takes so many years of practice and prep and training to just get to that point to be like Lou Wilson. Like Lou Wilson just ran up the ball rolling up. I mean, this is tattooed on, I saw, I saw on Twitter. The ball is rolling up as tattooed on somebody's calf. And that is just Lou right out just says the ball is rolling up. The ball is rolling up for a character who's like their whole life they're being crapped on. So like that was a really great catchphrase and that just came right out of Lou. So I think that probably a lot of and what people who want to get into production and people who want to become directors don't truly understand uh, until they're in the moment is that really is a race against the clock. And time management, I think what we see in BTS with tier one, like high end feature films, we see, um, you know, Taika Waititi, like having a good time talking to the actors and like, it's a great big set and it's a Marvel movie, but it doesn't feel like a Marvel movie. Like what's really happening behind the scenes is that they're, ra they're racing against time. They're racing against the, the, the clock of the day and they're racing against the days of the shoot. And so a lot of directing and a lot of what isn't really seen in the world of directing is that I'm doing a lot of time management. I'm doing a lot of uh, calculations. So that that really comes into play when we're shooting the minis uh, because I have a shot list in my head. I have, Not in my head, I have a shot list written out. I make a live shot list while we're shooting the episode. So I'm making my shot list as we're going and I'm just putting everything down. And then I go over that shot list and I go, this is a big moment. This is a big moment. And then I make a list of about 80 shots that I want to get um, in, a, in a shoot day for minis. 80 shots. And 80 shots. And that ultimately will become 65 shots. So that's where sort of the art of directing comes in because I just have to start killing darlings almost immediately because certain shots take a long time to set up and we have this hazer and we have this light and we want to make it look nice. And so then I'm, I'm sort of actively starting to t looking down my shot list and going, okay, now I'm going to take that one off. I'm going to take that one off. And it distills down into from my original 80. Well, a, a, a episode, the, the list that I make after an episode is 120 shots about for a Brennan battle. So then I pick the 80 that I would be like, this is my ideal number of minis. I like a mini shot about once every two minutes, right? So then when we shoot, then it, it gets distilled down to about 65. So it's all about racing the clock because we don't go over. Once you go over the budget, you know, it, it's all money that's attached to each other. So if I start going over for my mini shoots, it's going to start taking away from the next season, which means less minutes, which means not as good as a show. So we're all just sort of honoring our future selves by making sure that we stay on time and um, stay on budget. And that's really the key to it all. But yeah. Looking at a mini shot list and being like, this is what fans want to see. This is what fans want to see. This one's going to be hard. This one's multiple angles. We're going to do this one like a, you know, like that kind of thing. Uh, there's just so much technical thinking when it comes into it. And I think that it, it, and it should feel like magic. And I'm glad that it feels like magic, but it is very, very technical. Uh, okay. So the next question is from Jason. 
Uh, Mr. Schabach, you've directed quite a number of Dimension 20 seasons now, and I was wondering yeah. if you could pick what the theme of the season, After Never After, could be. This was before uh, the Ravening War came <laughs> Ravening out. Ravening War! There! Uh, I answered the question! <laughs> Wait, no, no, but the question is different. Uh, yeah. Uh, after Never After could be, what wouldn't it be? In short, what's the one thing you do not want setting foot on Dimension 20? Thank you, and take you to you, Orn. Okay, so this is the question, because normally the question I get is, what season would you love? Yes. Uh, this is, what's, what do I never want to do? Yes. Here's what I'd never want to do for Dimension 20. I never want to, uh, I never want to do a season of Dimension 20 that doesn't feel inventive, that doesn't feel new and fresh, even sequel seasons. Even sequel, like like Ravening War being a prequel, that should feel like its own thing, its own world, fresh and new, even though it is a part of another part of a season. I never, ever want to do something that feels stale and that feels vanilla, that feels uninventive, uh, that feels like uh, we're cruising. You know what I mean? Like when you're just hitting 55 and you put on the cruise control, I never want to do a season that feels like we're just on cruise control. I always want to be doing a season that's like, okay, this was hard to make. This was a challenge. So that's it. There's, it isn't a single genre that I wouldn't want to hit. I want to get, I want to touch everything and I want to see everybody at the table. I want to see all kinds of people at the table to come in and play D&D. People who are professional TTRPG players and people who have never played before. I want to bring them all into the dome and I want to give them the Brennan Lee Mulligan experience. Uh, <laughs> and so that they can all know how cool this game is and how meaningful it can be. Okay. Uh, now we have uh, two questions uh, from Jack One Spade. This is already from after the the, uh, the Ravening War trailer came out. Uh, so this, these are, you'll see. Uh, so the question is, uh, J Jack One Spade asks, what is your favorite aspect about returning to this setting, this setting mean, meaning Calram? Uh, was there something that was intended for season one, such as attempting to make a dog for each nation, that went unfinished, that was un that was able to be completed this time around? How, first, so first, the first question was, was I excited to come back to Calorum? Yes. Uh, that season was a nutty season. We, we had to move studios. We ended up having to take down the, the, the dome, rebuild the dome, and we only started a day late having to do all of that stuff. Um, it was just a really special time. And it was a really, we were trying all different kinds of new stuff, which was the mini minis and doing the, the larger battles and being able to film all that stuff was really cool. I just have a special place in my heart for that show because uh, I had my second son after we wrapped on that show. And then um, that was fall of 2019. So we all know what happened um, in the spring. So that was the last time we were all together until um, Starstruck, uh, the core cast. So I was absolutely excited to have it uh, come back. And I knew that having Matt Mercer be the DM for it, I knew that Matt would throw his entire heart and soul into uh, the lore of, of uh, A Crown of Candy. And I knew, in, I knew without any hesitation that he was going to come in and just absolutely build on uh, what was already there and also add to it. Um, which is what makes Matt Mercer so so absolutely brilliant is that uh, is that serving the the franchise and serving the story wasn't going to be enough for him. He had to he had to because it's part of his DNA bring something new and special to that world, and he did. And uh, maybe this is a spoiler, but absolutely uh, brought something to life that that uh, that might that Brennan might have wanted to do in the original series, but simply didn't have time. So there is something in there. There is something in this storytelling that goes in a direction that I don't think any, I I certainly couldn't have anticipated. It's mm -hmm. uh, I mean I can't say enough about it. It's it's going to be a wild ride, and any assumptions that you might have about it, you can throw them out the window because it's Matt Mercer. It's Matt Mercer. Okay. This is so exciting. Like every, every little bit about this season, it, it's so, so good. <laughs> it's um, great. Okay. Uh, the next question from Jack One Spade is, uh, this is to Oren and Shawbuck. 
What do you think you would be in Caloram? You can choose either you as yourself or a PC you would enjoy. But those two answers are not the same thing. Okay, you go. What would you be? I go? Okay. So this is kind of weird. But I think I would be uh, a chicken nugget person with mayonnaise <laughs> for hair. <laughs> because because chicken nuggets like... Meatlander! Uh, it's... <laughs> Oh, so uh, with mayonnaise for hair. So you're so a meatlander and the dairy aisle. So a combination there. Yeah, yeah. It it would be like because I'm not sure like if mayonnaise has dairy because it's like eggs. Yeah. Uh, oh, is it eggs? Oh, okay. So it's all the same. Yeah, it's world. eggs. You would yes, be a full-on meatlander. Yes. <laughs> I love that. That's really good. A chicken nugget person. Oh my gosh, can you imagine the mini that Rick Perry would make? <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, I would definitely just be a bar of dark chocolate because dark chocolate is absolutely my most favorite thing in the whole wide world. And I, I have it on set as part of my energy units, like the things I take on for for my energy. And just like just to be a part of Candia and and that whole thing. I think I'm just like a sweets guy, and that's exactly where I'd want to be. This, I'd want to I'd want to be part of my DNA, and that's where I'd want to grow up. <laughs> that's cool that's amazing yeah <laughs> really, really suits your energy i i must admit oh thank you <laughs> yeah we were asked the question what would we be in i think it was for a court of fame flowers and uh what kind of animal would you be uh i think it was court of fame flowers and i said i want to be a hummingbird i absolutely love hummingbirds and i think it was brendan who was like that's like that's it that's exactly right. You're the hummingbird. You're the happy little bird that's flying around. And this and that and that. Yeah, it's just like a busy bird. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. The next question is uh, from Scully. And the question is, what are some of the biggest hurdles y'all, y'all encounter in producing the season of D20? And how do you navigate those hurdles? For instance, from an outsider's perspective, it seems like time constraints are often cited as particularly heinous hurdles to the cast's ability to finish threads of the stories they weave, uh, which makes the high quality of the landings all the more impressive. Is yeah. that similarly true for the production end? Thanks for all the work you do. It's impossible to convey how much this show means to me. Such a short source of joy, comfort, catharsis, and, most, in, and most importantly, corn cuties. <laughs> corn cuties. Corn <laughs> cuties. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about it enough, but it's, we are the clock is our collective enemy, and it is for everybody. When we have a set number of episodes we're doing in a season, and we're making basically an entire s- t- television series in the amount of time that we're doing it, um, yeah, there's a lot of hopes and dreams that go into uh, character story arcs and what they want to convey because... All of the all of the actors that have come into the dome have always carried a piece of themselves, and that and that that's what I find so amazing about the core cast too is that every season the core cast finds something personal about themselves that they want to bring to the table and they want to share with the world, which is tremendously courageous, uh, but also very very hard to do, and so um, the fact that they do land them uh, in the time allotted really is a testament to their ability to be. Um, uh, their testament to their ability to improvise and to put together a great story with Brennan. Um, it, it, it's time. Time is the great enemy. But at the end of the day, we have a budget. We have a certain amount of money that we're allowed to spend for the show. And we do our very, very best to put the, our best foot forward and create the best possible product we can create. I think sometimes the constraints can be helpful too. They can help tie things up that need to be tied up. And um, you know, ultimately, everybody just needs to go home at the end of the day. That's critically important. You need to go home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Andrew B. The question is, what are some of your favorite shots or close-ups of the minis? Oh, wow. Well, gosh. Uh, you know, um, when Fig meets her dad, that scene, like, there was so much, like, shooting Fantasy High, we were inventing f- from nothing. I mean, it, it was such a special... It was such a special time. We were doing it. We would come in early. So the way the schedule was for Fantasy High, we had to shoot almost exclusively in the evenings because there were a few people that had day jobs. And of course, like 
College humor still needed to make sketches. So a lot of the actors that were at the table were also shooting sketches during the day. So they were doing a full, we were all doing a full day of work and then shooting Fantasy High in the evening. So we were we were actually shooting the battles. Now we shoot them several weeks later, um, but we were shooting the battles in the morning and then we were shooting the show at night. And that's kind of how we did our schedule. But, but we cut a hole in the table for that, for the glowing red, when she looks down and sees the glowing red and then the shot reverse shot where she's standing here and and we just got that big you know first the first the reveal of her on the shoulder and then that um in unsleeping city with the cat and the moon uh there's so much collaboration that goes into the mini shoot like the mini shoot's not going to be fun if i come in and go um this is my shot list these are going to be my shots I'm going to meticulously direct every single shot and you're going to do it exactly how I say. Like, that's just that's just no fun, right? Like, I have a team, it's a small team that does the mini shoots of super creative, amazing, talented people. I have a, a art director and an art director's assistant. I have my DP, first AC. Uh, I have my producer there. Um, why wouldn't I open the conversation up to ideas that maybe I could never even think of. And so I wanted this, uh, this low angle shot of the cat and my DP Santiago Bati at that time, um, he was my DP for a, a bunch of seasons, was like, I can put a moon behind the cat and some clouds. Um, yeah. And I was like, yeah. And that's the other thing too. It's like, what do we take time doing? Well, any, any inspired shot like that, we take time to do. Uh, and so, yeah, just, it's just, it's just so much fun. It's so, it's so collaborative and so just like, it's like pure creativity that like anytime somebody's like, I have an idea, it's like, yeah, let's hear it, you know, because I'll be like, um, so for, uh, never after, for example, right? Like, um, uh, that we had the scene of toy, uh, the, the battle on toy Island and we had Pinocchio's. Uh, connection to the dogfish was sort of actualized, right? Like how that felt, his connection to the dogfish and their forever connection. And, um, you know, it was it was sort of narrated as like a string. There's this, you know, it was like, there's the string that I have from my heart to the dogfish. And so I went to um, my art director, Katie McGeorge, who's absolutely brilliant and amazing. And I said, hey, do, do you have like a string? You know, like we're th this is while we're shooting, you know, like what what they're they look at my shot list before and sort of have some props ready to go. But a lot of the props are being made in that moment. And um, she's like, hold on, I got something better and took plastic bags and just started melting white and blue plastic bags. And the way they just started to melt up and create these little water droplets and this wave like thing over this string piece, I was just like. And she did it in like three minutes. And it was like, I was just going to do like a, like a string. And here she created what looks like the string bursting through the waves of the ocean connected to Pinocchio. It was like, how, how could you not collaborate? Like, I don't know. So all the shots that we do, I love them all. Those stand out in my mind because those were the moments where we were like, in the beginning when we were shooting... Um, fantasy high we didn't really know what we're doing I was like I was recording all the moves like our shot lists were crazy we were moving really really fast because it was like what do people want to see now I kind of know what people want to see and what people want to see are like the big moves and the big moves shot and done well from different angles so that we can really get in there see the minis and tell the story that has motion in stillness but still has the motion effect to it uh, so yeah Though th those were the early moments where we were like, no, 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 let's let's pause here and let's really give this moment the shots that it deserves. Um, those are always going to be my favorite. And that's what we're now focused on when we shoot minis, the big yeah. action moments. One thing I loved uh, in seeing in Never After, for example, was uh, that in, in like earlier seasons, there was like this narration and uh, and the B-roll was like over the narration itself. But now there's like this pause and like, uh, for example, uh, revealing the first fight in Ever After, uh, there was a pause in Brennan's narration and then it was like this room 
room with like the music and all that. Like, so this was like, so like, like putting us into it, into like the scene. And, and I love that it's like, okay, now that there's a mood, it's not just like B-roll for narration. It's like, yeah. okay, so now it's like something special, something amazing. <laughs> So, um, yeah, we, I mean, this season of Never After in the minis, like, we only have a certain amount of time, and I try to get as much many shots as I can. The editing team that comes in, and they, I mean, our editors are amazing, and that first, that first battle was done by uh, our amazing editor, Tyler, and, uh, just just the, the extra work that they put into the blasts and the this and all the fun visual effects that they're able to do right there in the time that they have because everybody only has a certain amount of time uh they just took the minis to the next level and now n- like sorry like i i asked for it now like I, I, we record sound while we're shooting mini so i'll have an open dialogue with the editors and be like okay so what we have time for is to do this cool camera move can you guys add the spell that explodes in the thing thank you so much okay bye <laughs> <laughs> amazing <Yeah. laughs> okay uh the next question is from literally 100 people that's the name uh and okay. they ask People behind the scenes usually don't enjoy the notoriety of people whose faces are visible. What's the best way to learn about and appreciate the work of the crew that might otherwise go unnoticed? I love this question so much. The BTS <laughs> is, a, is a really good view into the show. Uh, so watch all the BTS stuff. Uh, some, some people tweet. Um, you know, some people don't want to be on camera. Some people like where they are in production. And so they they, they don't want all the attention. Uh, but yeah, read the um, the credits on IMDb and follow their projects and see what they're up to. That's a great way to appreciate them. But yeah, I mean, BTS, we try to get everybody on camera who wants to be on camera. That's why I say I make an announcement. Hey, we have BTS on set today. Anybody who doesn't want to be on BTS, you know, behind the scenes, just let us know you won't be filmed. Anybody that does, they'll find you and they'll film you doing the great stuff. But that's that's pretty much it. I mean, you really want to see like the talent of these people. You're watching it on the show. They, they're giving their all their heart and all their soul and all of their expertise and their talent to to the show. So if you're enjoying the show and it is moving you and it is changing who you are and making you think of things you've never thought of before or feeling emotions about things it's all the way down to the pa who gets lunch for us that every role on dimension 20 is equally important there is no one person that is more important uh obviously people who are on camera will uh you know naturally get more attention because they are on camera they're the people that we see it's a visual medium that makes perfect sense but just know that all of that that happens on the outside feeds into that dome so when somebody is expertly per- performing inside the dome it's because we expertly provided them all of the things they needed uh to be that expert on camera Okay, the next question is from Zachary Green. And Zachary asks, will we ever get a Bob Ross Joy of Painting series? But it's Rick Perry and the creative team teaching us to craft beautiful D&D oh set pieces and create stomach acid resistant orange hat minis. <laughs> I love it. Look, Rick soothes me, so I wanna watch that show. <laughs> Rick has the most soothing voice and soothing personality. I would love just like a couple cameras on him as he's like, all right, here we go. And we're going to pick this color and we're going to, I think that's a, that's a great, that's a great show idea. Uh, we've worked, we've worked a few projects that actually he's just worked on uh, the trailer for Ravening War, Knox Weiler Burf, um, who's a great, brilliant um, production designer, but also a, uh, a minis painter uh, and um, I believe Knox has had a show or has a show to watch too. So I highly recommend if you want to watch somebody making some uh, high end minis, it's uh, seek out Knox Weiler Burf. Uh, but yes, the uh, joy of painting minis by Rick Perry is a show that must exist at some point in time. I demand it. 
Uh, yes. So I'm going to take that back to the creative team and we're going to say, Rick would totally be down too. Oh, you, oh, you want to put a couple of cameras on me? Well, I go, oh, yeah, sure. If you want to do that, go right ahead. Uh, I could totally <laughs> see it. Yes, please. I want that. Amazing. The next question is from Jason Hustler. And uh, Jason asks, do the minis and maxis get used for internal games played by the staff? <laughs> I wish. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> they don't, especially after the first auction. The, the minis are, are uh, <laughs> carefully wrapped up and put away in storage away from all of our, our grubby little hands the moment uh, we're done shooting the minis. Uh, it's a, and look, mini shoots is not, it's not kind to minis, I'll say that. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to the big orchestration of some of the shots and cameras fall on those little guys and they get dropped and uh, we're shooting, uh, we're shooting never after, uh, we dropped one of the NPCs, uh, it was probably, I think it was one of the princesses and, um, uh, she just exploded. Like she exploded on the ground and her, what, what she was, uh, I think she was holding a book at, and we, I just, we had all the lights on and the entire crew, we were just on our hands and knees and we were trying to find this tiny little book because we had more <laughs> to shoot. And for continuity, we needed that book to to continue shooting. So yes, uh, it would be fun to do. Uh, it would be fun to have time to do a crew <laughs> game of D&D, &D, but we make so much of the show that nobody really has any time to even play it. But if we could, I would absolutely want to play with those minis. And no, we're not allowed to uh, because they need to go and find new homes with great and wonderful uh, fans of the show who help contribute. Uh, to the financial future of the show by bidding on those minis. And uh, we're so excited that they find new homes because otherwise it would just be in storage and that's not where they belong. Okay, good shout out that uh, there is an auction happening right now, I think, on the yep. Dropout store. Uh, I'll have a link to that uh, below. Um, the next question is from Z3DT. Uh, and they ask, Hey Shabak, thank you for all the hard work you do for the series. Dimension 20 got me through COVID lockdowns and people often forget that you guys behind the scenes are just as much to think as the people on camera. My question, did you have any experience on producing something like an actual play show before D20? If not, what aspects of the things you've worked on before transferred unexpectedly well to producing D20? I mean, I'd done some unscripted, but nothing like a TTRPG. So I would played some D&D &D in high school, and it's something that's always sort of been around me. But I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a, a player when I got brought on to to do the show. Um, so I think that I think that no matter what project I I go on to, I always bring, uh, you know, the same types of tools. And a lot of that is this like, um, it's it's language it's it's the way you to speak to people it is the expectations that you have for the quality of the content all of those things sort of apply across the board and so i just brought all of that expertise uh, to this uh, dimension 20 and just sort of applied what what has worked for me in the past which is creating sets that are fun to work on that are mutually respectful where everybody is the same is is treated the same people on camera aren't worth more than people behind the camera like all of these things i know me saying it with somebody could be watching this and be like yeah of course of course that's true all humans are the same and all that it's not it's not true it's not true in this business there are people that are treated better and differently on sets um than other people and that's not my set so uh i think that the um overall what i was doing without even really doing it without knowing in the beginning, now I intentionally do it, which is the vibe, right? It's all about the vibe. And so the good vibes that I was able to create when I first started directing sketches into the longer form projects for Dropout was like, okay, this is right. This feels good. And people seem to be enjoying themselves and also working hard and they're coming back and they're not a lot of, th a lot of times like a, um, if a, a somebody on the production team isn't really like v digging the project that they're on they'll replace themselves so you kind of get an indication as to like how the project is going or how good it is by how many people are replacing themselves and so mm -hmm. i was noticing like the better the vibe was the more cool the set was to work on the less people would replace themselves so it's less people that we have to train in it's less people that we have to onboard and that's really what makes 
Dimension 20 and any repeat series of success is that the more people you can get back from season to season, the less you have to explain. And then the better they can become at their job because they're standing on their own shoulders and doing something better. And I think that that <clears throat> the testament there is our current DP, Kevin um, Stiller, who's absolutely amazing and just like never stops with the tech is like never afraid to like bring in a new piece of tech to the point now where we have the, um, you know, we have a little stream deck for Brennan now and Brennan can control all the lighting. All that is was voluntary by our DP. It was like, we need this new technology. I'm going to learn this new technology. So uh, I, I think that the, me bringing what I had learned in previous projects to this set to create a world that's like openly creative and like everyone has a voice and everyone's treated equally was like the big thing that really makes a TTRPG work because it's a very hard job again to go into that dome and improvise for three hours. These are actors and actors are sponges of the world. And so if there's any drama or anything's happening on set, it's going to affect them. They're going to hear it. We're all in the same room together. You can't have an argument or a fight or somebody can't be mean to somebody without somebody else hearing it, right? So like it's going to affect them. It's going to change the way they perform on camera. So it's critically important that everybody comes in and treats each other respectfully and that everybody feels like they have a voice in a place and that they belong there. That's my biggest message to people, right? That's how I kick off almost all of my, all of my safety meetings is just in case you're wondering, you all belong here. You are all meant to be here to make this show. Whatever it is you did in your life that led you to this moment, that's what got you here. The people that you met, the project that you worked on, everything built up to this one moment, and this is where you belong to make this awesome show. Okay, that's very inspirational. I love it. Uh, okay, there's now we have a fan question that I lowered expectation from because I know you, uh, you can't uh, really answer it. Okay. Uh, candidly, uh, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, the question is from Jack One Spade, and the question is: I think this is the question that everyone wants to know. Can we get a look at that juicy lore doc, pretty please? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Um, look, it's not up yeah. to me. It's juicy. Yeah. It's good, you know. I, here's here's what I'll say. Molly Maloney is our lore keeper. Molly Maloney is this amazing. Uh, she's an amazing script supervisor, and she works on a lot of really big shows that I'm not allowed to even tell you what she works on. But if you could imagine some very popular television shows, Molly Maloney works on those shows. Molly comes to our show because she loves D and D. She loves Dimension Twenty, and she loves to be a part of that process. And the doc that she creates, almost kind of live. Because it has to be, right? Like, there's some ideas. We all know in TTRPG, there's an idea of the direction that we want to go. My God, like, uh, uh, Rick Perry doesn't build sets overnight. Like, some of that stuff it has to be planned out. But how they get there and what's said and what characters are invented along the way, that's all there. And Molly is just there typing away the entire episode. Uh, it's good. It's a good doc. It's thorough. It is a thorough doc. Um, and if I could, I would share it with the world so you could all see the amount of work that gets put in this and also see like what was invented. I think that's really the thing, right? What was invented in the moment and what was planned? And I'll say that a lot more was invented in the moment than what was planned. 100%. 100%. It's amazing. It, it, it really is. It's a testament to Brennan. It's Brennan's, it's his, it's his improvisational background and his genius mind. He's like, I can take anything. I can take it, you give it to me, I'm going to feed it back to you, and we're going to make this entertaining. Okay, so we have one final fan question. Uh, before we move to the final fan question, uh, do, you, uh, do you have uh, a different uh, um, like role for spoilers answer that you want to put in? Uh, or, I think, or... I, honestly, that's a good one. I, I'll, say, I'll say Ravening War. I, Ravening War went in a direction that Brennan Lee Mulligan didn't even see himself. Okay. And That's I'll good. say this too, another good one for you. Uh, as you're watching this season, there is a moment. Now, the love between uh, Matthew Mercer and Brennan Lee Mulligan is a big true love. They truly, truly love each other. They are very, very good friends. There is a moment in Ravening War where Matt Mercer falls even more deeply in love with Brennan Lee Mulligan. And it is a beautiful moment. And uh, so when you see it, 
uh, let me know through the Twitters or the Instagrams. Hey, Shabak, I saw the moment, uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, he falls even deep, more deeply in love with Brennan than he had been before. There's a moment there in that show that it happens, and it's so magical and beautiful. Okay. Did, I'm, I'm, but of course I'm, Mercer I'm, came in. Of course <laughs> Mercer came in into <laughs> Brennan's world and created something that Brennan couldn't even, you know what I mean, like predict. That was the game that Matt Mercer was playing. How can I sit in the seat, have Brennan be a player, and still surprise Brennan? Of course, that was his mission, and he was fully successful. Amazing! Wow, I I I can't wait. Okay, uh, the final fan question that we have is from Snack Captain Hazley, and the question is: Big fan, great work. While all the guests DMs. While well, all the guest DMs bring their own wonderfully unique spin and spin and energy, Abria is known for pushing certain limits of the dome. In the same vein, was there anything production-wise with Matt's debut that really affected or inspired your creative approach to D20 and other endeavors? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, Matt, Matt came in. I think Matt, came, Matt, Matt was just so and this is what okay so it's very nerve-wracking right to have Matthew Mercer come over and any guest DM we want to make sure that they they have the best experience obviously and we're so happy to have guest DMs and um uh I love working with them and it's so amazing uh Abria came in and and did the biggest thing any guest DMs ever done which is um during the one shot the holiday misfits Um, where we had the uh, snowflakes and we had the beast in silhouette walking behind the walls. Before that, we actually had um, covering on the back of the walls because it helped the LEDs that were back there project bigger onto the um, dome walls. But because she invented this idea of having this projection, we pulled the backs off the walls. And that is ultimately what gave birth to projections as we know now. So when Matt came in and, um, you know, a lot of that, it was just more perfecting for us. So, so for Matt, it was finding the right illustrator for projections and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, the controlling of it all, like we, we sort of, it was like, it was like a fine tuned machine that Matt could come into and sit down and feel maybe some of the stuff that he has for critical role that were also there that were familiar because that's the other thing too, is we just want to make sure that he can focus on the game. So, I mean, the, the, the pride that I have about Ravening War was that we had Matt Mercer come in, have a wonderful experience, create something new and fresh for us within a world that Brennan had uh, uh, sort of built. He took it to the next level and the machine was so fine tuned and the team was so good at what they did was that their director who was homesick with influenza watching remotely, the show still was able to be created expertly and everybody was able to go on and, and do their jobs and create a, a product that was amazing. Even with that obstacle, um, it just makes me prideful. And and um, yeah, like I said, I think in regards to Mercer and Ravening War, uh, you're just gonna love it. And uh, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. You're gonna just enjoy it. Okay. Uh... These were all the fan questions. Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for all of the answers and all of your uh, uh, amazing insights and time. Uh, I have one final question for you. Uh, yeah. And uh, before I ask it, uh, I do want you to tell people uh, uh, where they can find you or where they can, uh, where, where do you want to point them to after watching this interview? Uh, be it dropout or something uh, of your own. Uh, and uh, what is one thing you're excited about the next season of Dimension 20? Okay. Answer to the first question. Obviously, get a dropout subscription. It's what, six bucks a month? I don't even know what it is now, but it's super cheap. You get all this amazing content. Uh, you can sort of see Annual the is history. better. <laughs> and get the annual. Yes, I always find the annual in any of these subscriptions is better. Uh, watch Dimension 20, but also watch all the other shows that, that are there to offer and watch the, all the older content too. You know, uh, uh, 
uh, Total Forgiveness and Gods of Food were just amazing projects to work on. And Gods of Food is so beautiful. And we just like we just took our time with with making that a beautiful show. And uh, Total Forgiveness is is makes me squirm to this day just thinking about the things that we captured for that. Um, and also some really beautiful moments. I mean, Allie's, Allie's talk at the, at the, at the bookstore. I, I can't watch that scene without crying. And I don't know how many times I've seen that scene. So that's just a, just a pure beautiful moment mixed with some just complete total havoc. Um, but the thing that I'm most excited about, uh, is obviously the continuation of Dimension 20. Stay tuned. We have some amazing stuff coming up. We have some, uh, after Ravening War, we have some amazing stuff. So, so just to know that we are working tirelessly to keep bringing the uh, magic for that show. And we have some really, really cool stuff coming down the pipe. Um, also, I had the honor of working on a Desi Quest. And Desi Quest is, a, is an all South Asian cast uh, run by Jasmine Bular. And uh, we shot that, uh, um, you know, uh, two months ago. Uh, it's now in post-production. There was a big Kickstarter last uh, fall for it. And uh, they called me up uh, to direct it. And I was so honored and blessed to do it. And it was so fun to make. And we have an amazing cast around that table. And Jasmine just does an amazing job. And we cannot wait to show that to you. So keep an eye out for, for Desi Quest. Uh, things will start to come out, trailers and all of that. It's going to be a lot of fun. It was just a tremendously wonderful experience to be a part of and so honored to be a part of it, to put uh, that cast around that table and uh, ha have representation and be seen like that in such a big way uh, for a Desi cast. It's just amazing. It was such an honor to be a part of it. So look for Desi Quest. Uh, some of you who are watching this are already ready for it and and excited to see it. Um, please know that all we, there we've brought in a lot of really 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 talented people to make that show, and uh, everybody gave all of their hearts, souls, and their guts to that show, and uh, we've put on something really great and new. And Jasmine, who comes in and just like knows knows the genre so well and has been a part of it for so long and has really put in the work and has the receipts in that genre comes in and even has newer and fresher ideas that we were able to execute uh, it's just i just sit in awe i just sit in awe of all of the dms that i've been able to work with and the creativity and the um the ingenuity that they bring to to all the shows that they do it's just it's inspirational amazing so, the final question that I have for you. What's in the future of you and Dimension 20 and Dropout? Look, the future is bright. Um, there's some really big, exciting stuff that we're doing with the show. Not just the, the, uh, future, the future seasons of the show um, that we have lined up and the stuff that we're going into. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure it was... Uh, I'm sure that it was a little uh, appetizing when I, we had to delay this by a day because I had to go to set yesterday. So clearly I went to set for something. Um, there's, there's just, there's just, <laughs> there's so much fun and cool stuff coming down the pike for dimension 20 and something really, really, really super neat happened uh, this spring. And we are so excited to share that with the dimension 20 fam. There's, a plan for the rollout of this thing and uh i'm just excited for everyone to see it and when you see it uh when you see it i want everyone to hear my voice in their head when they're seeing the the uh reveal of this new thing and that is we have this because of everybody that watches dimension 20. because of your your uh love for the show we have this thing that you're going to see um, so I just want to say thank you and that it's so special and it's get, it's so meaningful to the show and it just means, uh, it just means so much to us. And the, th the, the overarching thing I will say about Dimension 20 is that this is going to be more. And my future, <laughs> as long as they call me up and say, hey, we want you on it, I'm going to say yes. I ne never say no to Dimension 20. I'm going to say yes for the rest of my life for as long as that show is going to be made. I want to be a part of it because it's so special and cool. So it's just going to be more. It's going to be bigger. It's going to be better every season. It's going to be things that you've never even thought of. It's going to be casts that you could have never even imagined. It's just, it's, 
It's endless fun for me, and I want to be a part of it for as long as they have, they want me. Hey, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Geek Peak. Before I let you go, I want to thank the individuals who went the extra mile and became my patrons. So, without further ado, thank you to Arthur Morrill, Bob Prescott, Lexi Gardner, Cody Neville, Charlie Fisher, Stote Dross, Laura Jane Hamilton, Maggie, Grace Bauer, Captain Casno, Tyler Felsted, Ella Lubell, Mandy Kennedy, Ross Simpson, Jacob Koch, Emma Rose, D20 is my church, Patch Kelly, Sarah Kate Noel, Zachary Tyndall, Trevor Williams, and Chaos Alpha. If you want to join them, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Owen Cohen, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.